when nobody goes. Up a track. Through a gate. The food forest grows with secrets and treasures for everyone's pleasure. And Rose discover, Rose discover. Good morning. It's the second weekend in May. It's a glorious time to be alive in England, in the countryside. And look, I've just been down to the village to collect an old shed from a kind neighbour who's donated it to me. And in a couple of weeks time, I hope to use it to construct a shelter for a composting toilet. But we'll, um, we'll do that another time. Today, there is a lot to do. And fortunately, I have a glamorous assistant to help me film things whilst I do it. The first thing is to prepare the various beehives around the forest garden and make them attractive to any scout bees that might be out and about looking for a place to make a new home. So yes, attracting swarms is the first thing today. So let's go and do that. Got a thornless bramble growing there, bouncing all over the place. Ah, hopefully you didn't hear the click of my knees as I knelt down then. There are 10 different style of beehive around the forest garden. This particular one is a Siberian style log hive in that it mimics a dead hollow fallen tree. It has a removable panel at the lower end so that it's possible once in a while if the bees are doing really well to access some honeycomb from this end but in general it's uh, like a conservation hive and once the bees have moved in you leave them alone to to do their thing and the reason it has a removable cap at the lower end is because on the occasions that one does open it none of the pheromones or atmosphere from the inside of the hive are lost so you can uh, open it with very very little disturbance. It has three slits about a centimeter wide up the south facing side which the, it seems to be ideal for the bees and the ones they're not using they seal up with propolis the bee glue and then open them and close them depending on the number of bees going in and out and the time of year. To make this hive attractive to any scout bees that might be out and about testing for places to bring the rest of the swarm to make a new home, I am going to lure them with two essential oils that I found very good for luring bees or making it welcoming, welcoming to them as we now say. One is lavender oil and the other one is lemongrass oil. Lemongrass oil because it's said that it smells very similar to the queen bee pheromone which is quite a citrusy lemony smell if you ever smell it. I'm just going to smear some mm, and on myself as well so I'll be attractive to, to bees. I just, I just love it. I don't know if you should put essential oil directly on your skin but well uh, best not but I, I just did. Um, so smear some on the inside and then some lavender oil around the entrance. Just to, um, it'll uh, <laughs> attract those scout bees. One of the things detrimental to honeybees that many of them across Europe have is the varroa mite that you might have heard of that's a parasitic uh, blood-sucking mite that you find on many honeybees and a way to combat that I'm experimenting with and it's working very well so far is I've installed what I call a fake forest floor 
in all the hives. It's difficult to put there once the bees have moved in, so I've put it there beforehand. And essentially, it's just rotting detritus that I've scooped out of an existing dead tree somewhere that bees might like to make their home. And I've put it inside the hive. And the idea is it contains all kinds of microscop microscopic organisms and earwigs and the like. And unlike a traditional hive, the wood on the inside of this one is rough, so the bees can itch themselves against the rough wood and knock off the mite. It falls down to the bottom of the hive, and before it can crawl back up the sides and reattach itself to the bee, it gets gobbled up by all the, the creatures in this, in this uh, rotten detritus on the floor. For example, an earwig can eat 12 varroa mites in the day, and there are all kinds of other things I don't know the names of that will also eat varroa mites. And it's just good for the general health of the hive, having all those creatures at the bottom to, to clear up their mess. The thing is though, until the swarm actually comes, I need to keep this floor moist to stop it from drying out so that the organisms don't die. So I need to give it a, a spray with water once every, every week or so. But now I will put these oils in my pocket, seal this hive back up, and then go on and bait the next one. Hopefully there'll be a swarm of bees this month, because a swarm of bees in May is worth a load of hay. <laughs> I know friends that have had swarms already. I'm just being hopeful there'll be some in the next week or two. May named after the Roman goddess Maia, the goddess of growth. It's really true how things are growing so fast at the moment. I've dedicated about an acre of this two acre site to being a wild flower meadow. And there's so much stuff growing. Well, actually that's what I've planted. It's a, it's a goji berry bush and a rosa rugosa cherry tree doing very well. An acre of, of wild flower meadow contains a multitude of, of insects, uh, about, if you added them all up, I think about a fifth of a ton, and not related to meadows, but this here, you might have seen just now in some cutaways of the various hives, is what's known as a waspinator. That's its brand name, and it's a fake wasp's nest. A wasp well, one wasp can do a lot of damage in a honeybee hive. It can eat many honeybees a minute. Last year, I lost four colonies of honeybees to wasps. They just went in. I wasn't watching for a couple of days. And when I checked, there were just decapitated bee carcasses everywhere. And when I mentioned this at my local beekeeping group I go to, they said, well, haven't you got a waspinator? I said, what's a waspinator? They said, oh, that's what we have to, um, <laughs> to keep the wasps away from our beehives. So I ordered a couple of these off the internet. They were two for um, 10 pounds or something. And it's a bit like a bean bag and you stuff it with hay or straw or newspaper. This one's uh, stuffed with my old socks that uh, <laughs> I didn't have time to darn. And to wasps, it looks like a wasp's nest with this infrared pattern printed on it. And the wasps don't come near. So I'm hoping this year there will be uh, no problem with wasps. And I've dangled one just here next to these three or four hives and another one over in that apiary next to those three or four hives. What am I doing here? Oh yes, that's right. I'm preparing this hive ready to try and lure a swarm. So out come the oils. Well, I'll, I'll do it in a minute. You can stop that now if you want. I'll, I'll do it in a moment. <laughs> Please stop it. <laughs> One thing that needs doing quite frequently this time of year is to remove all the, the docks and the hogweeds from the ground. 
I don't really mind docks because I use docks as mineral accumulators. They bring all the minerals up from the subsoil and then, well, I, I chop them down and mash them up so it, it spreads them nicely over the surface. But hogs, hogweeds on the other hand, they can cause really nasty skin rashes and irritation. But like everything else here, nothing gets wasted and the ponies absolutely love these. So I'm gonna give them a treat now. Lovely hogweeds. Yum, yum. If it wasn't for this rabbit proof fence all the way around the outside of the plot, there'd be a real problem with rabbits. I've done it the, the cheating way. Well, it's not cheating, it's the easy way. Having a three foot roll of chicken wire and have it, having it uh, one foot down and two feet across. Mm -hmm. And then after a season, the, the grass locks it into the ground and rabbits, they try to dig under it when they get to the wire, find that there's mesh in the ground, move along a bit, try again, and they never think about stepping backwards. And it's, it's, it's a really easy way of making a rabbit proof fence. And it's badger proof too, for that matter. And it's, um, yeah, worked well this last three years. There you go, my dears. There you go. Look at that. Look at that. Mm. Rain! First rain in seven weeks! So that means I don't have to do the watering today. The trees desperately, desperately need it. The forest garden, once it's established, the density of the roots makes it pretty drought resistant and flood resistant actually. Resistant. <laughs> but today it's really, really exciting because, uh, yeah, it's long overdue. And it's the cuckoo actually, which I haven't heard yet, worryingly enough. I should probably get a coat. <laughs> uh, you can come with me if you like. sheltering from the rain, it's a good time for a quick snack. I've been asked a few times, what was that horrible looking green stuff you were eating in the bowl before? Well, I call it Shreky Brecky. Shreky because it's green, the sort of thing Shrek might eat, and Brecky because I often have it for breakfast. But what goes into a good Shreky Brecky? Well, let me tell you. It's chewy but not like toffee, just takes a long time to eat. It's not only for brekkie, it could be for lunchy <laughs> or just a treat. You start with a chopped banana or any fruit you please. Then some honey and some pollen, a help from friendly bees. Soak the nuts to remove the phytic acid, some chia seeds for strength. And some oats to bulk it up, making up a tenth. A good few seasonal berries, it's strawberries this week. And next goes spirulina, to add the Shrek mystique. And lastly is the flaxseed, for omega 6 and 3. The fresh and pure spring water, to blend it perfectly. So make time for Shrekky Brecky, the best thing you'll eat today. For if you don't make time for wholesome snacking, 
Make time for melody. Shrek, 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 yum, yum, yum. Shrek, 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 yum, yum, yum. Shrek, 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 yum, yum, yum. It's Shreky Brecky. Had a really good tidy up in the greenhouse yesterday and everything is pleasingly spick and span and there are many things ripening and ready there are lovely red strawberries ready to eat in may strawberries in may and the peaches are getting fuzzier and getting bigger and there are little bunches of grapes on the grapevines all the seeds are now planted out a little bit late some of them but some of them are ready already, like the kale that you saw me sucking and planting last time. They're ready to be planted outside. And also some shallots that were a strain that my great-grandfather developed and kept going all his life, and I'm continuing them, so they're quite special. And I'm going to show you two methods I use for planting things outside. Again, both quite unusual. So, I will take this tray of kale, take the shallots, and meet you outside. But first, I should mention about how I stop the mice decimating the seeds and feasting on them, which they love to do. And that is a couple of drops of peppermint oil in a water sprayer, and every couple of days, puff puff over the seeds. Smells quite minty fresh, and the mice hate it. What am I doing? Oh yeah, kale seeds. She'll take them outside. Well, all of them came up. They were a great success, but a large orange slug was spotted in the night, feasting on all the um, the tops. So unfortunately, he's eaten half of them, but we've got about half left. So we'll see what we can do. Method one is a bit controversial, especially when I mention it amongst members of gardening clubs. See, most vegetable patches are bare earth. Nature doesn't like bare earth. He likes to fill it with plants, weeds as some people call them. Well, <laughs> some things are weeds if they're not where you want them. This is an extremely lazy method of gardening, but last year I had great success with it and I'm doing this as a bit of a demonstration. I've already planted some tomatoes and aubergines in, um, in these grassy plots. I'm just preparing this one to plant the shallots in. And the idea is you plant them directly into the grass or whatever else is growing here. And they seem to do rather well, especially the second year after you've collect the, collected the seeds from the first year and they've, they've adapted slightly. The grass seems to protect them from all kinds of pests and creatures and protects them against drought and uh, shelters them from the, the sun. And it gives other things like tomatoes and the creeping beans a structure to craw crawl through. What I'm doing now is I'm not planting it directly in the grass as it is. I'm chopping the grass up a bit using this fantastic multi-purpose garden tool. It's called a, fortunately I have it, written on the thing itself so I can read it. Ploskores uh, Fokina, which I believe is Russian for... I don't know what's Russian for, but it's a, it's a three-sided Russian uh, multi-purpose garden tool. It's, it's really good, you could do many things with it. At the moment, well I'll just uh, close up here, well I'll, I'll put that in afterwards. It's got three sharp sides and you can use it for many things. I use it for to start with chopping the grass down with and then using the spiky ends to kind of break up hard turfs of grass and to break the soil up a bit. 
and then I use it as a like a, a draw hoe to to create channels and I can also use it as a rake to to pull away the grass afterwards. I think I'll plant the shallots here first and then the kale later. out and leave half of them in this tray in the greenhouse and plant the other half with my special method in the grass outside and then we can compare the two to see how they do. I've temporarily abandoned my Russian cutting tool in favour of this metal pole. It seems to be better at making holes in the ground suitable for shallots. A few holes in a row. Let's pop one in. Perfect. Look at that. I hope they'll be very happy here. I should say at this point that most things in the forest garden are perennial and you can get perennial versions of most annual vegetables. These particular shallots are annual but it's it's fun to plant some annual things sometimes and you can't always get the exact variety you want in a perennial version so this is just just for fun really and to keep the strain going. They blend in with the grass pretty well so I'm just marking out the corners of the plot <laughs> with stakes. So we'll come back in a while, well I say a while, like a few months, <laughs> and dig them up and see how they've multiplied. <laughs> the other method, and it's probably a more reliable one, well not reliable but it's more well known and a more common method. It's a cross between hugel culture, I think that's how it's said, it's German for, for hill culture or mound culture and that's where you dig uh, a shallow trench and fill it with dead wood and whatever other biomass you have available like grass cuttings and, and, and straw or, or leaves and then you cover it back over with the soil you dug out to make, well, like a, like a mound. And that's good for a number of reasons, because as the wood slowly rots, it keeps releasing nutrients into the bed for like 10 or 15 years, or 20 years if it's a hard wood. And it extends the growing season slightly because it, it uh, generates warmth as it decomposes as well. It also increases the surface area because it's a mound, so it makes for more efficient gardening. And it's, it's great because grass doesn't like growing upwards so much, it only likes growing across or down, so it's very easy to keep the edges grass free without using any particular border. There's a lot more to say about hugel culture, but it's easy to look up, and it's a cross between that and uh, sheet mulching or lasagna gardening, is, it's a bit more, more of a fun name, <laughs> and that's like, like making a lasagna on the ground. It's like composting in situ. It's where you uh, well, you need to get the ground a bit flat to start with to get the weeds and the, the grass down where you're going to lay the cardboard. I used to uh, strim a lot, but I've stopped strimming so much, uh, partly because, well, I used to like all the edges nice and, and neat. And, and really when you do that, not only is it lots of effort and, and waste of resources like fuel, but also you lose all the, the wild flowers and and things that come up around the outside and I especially 
don't want to stream this area because I saw lots of little baby frogs hopping through it the other day and amphibium, amphibian carnage is not on the cards. So yes, you get the ground uh, as flat as possible. Mm -hmm. You lay cardboard on top. That's to suppress the weeds and cardboard is biodegradable, the brown stuff, making sure you take the plastic off it first and there's any tape on it. Some good old ash wood. That'll rot down nicely. And weigh the cardboard down for now. <laughs> I should say at this point that a, well, an established forest garden is a completely closed loop system in that nothing ever goes in, and nothing ever goes out. Meaning that all the waste produced stays on site and gets recycled. But I couldn't resist this offer of some well-rotted horse manure from my neighbour down the road. And not that it needs any extra fertility, but it's good to create these non-dig beds I'm making and just to give it a head start really. But generally nothing's going to be taken off site, including human waste and nothing really needs to be brought in because once the trees grow and the leaves start falling and the like, it'll be a completely self-sustaining ecosystem. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> longer than I thought. <laughs> it's going to take a couple of hours longer to finish all this and dark is descending soon and I have some other things to do but there's no urgency about it anyway because I can't really plant in it for a year because for the first year the wood will be hungry and suck up all the nitrogen from the soil. I suppose I could plant legumes there that don't really need much nitrogen and actually put nitrogen back but yeah I'll, I'll do it another day and take my time about it because I need to prepare myself for slug watch tonight. There'll be a full moon rising soon and the, the beasts will be out. Oh, mustn't step on the onions. <laughs> hmm. Slimy slug. Hmm. Oh my. What are these? Uh, they are sunflower seeds. Hmm. I know a, a winged friend who would appreciate this for breakfast. <laughs> See if I can find some more. Sorry, little friend. In the bucket you go. Fee, fi, fo, fuck. <laughs> 